So I want to tell you about a man named Azim. So Azim was born to a family of business owners in Kenya, and they fled violence there to immigrate to the U.S. He ended up working as an investment banker based in San Diego, and he had two children, Tariq and Tasreen. One morning, Azim was drinking tea in his kitchen when the phone rang, and it was a police officer calling to tell him that his 20-year-old son, Tariq, had been shot and killed. Azim didn't believe it. It was impossible. Tariq was a dedicated college student who dreamed of becoming a National Geographic photographer. He and his fiancée, Jennifer, planned to move to New York City when they graduated. So Azim called Jennifer to clear this up. But unfortunately, she confirmed that it was true. That the night before, while working a shift delivering pizza for an Italian restaurant, Tariq had been shot by a group of teenagers. Azim dropped the phone and passed out on the kitchen floor. When he came to, this one mysterious phrase rang in his mind. There were victims on both ends of the gun. There were victims on both ends of the gun. So around 15,000 people are murdered in the U.S. each year. And the people who love them face a question. Can they forgive? Or can they not? If you were Tariq's parents, could you forgive? Is forgiveness even possible? I'm a skeptical journalist. I write about tough subjects like war, addiction, the challenges of immigrating to a new country, even terminal illness. I'm not writing for Hallmark here. And I'm especially obsessed with how people overcome the most difficult challenges. A couple years ago, I started to wonder how forgiveness might fit into that equation. I wasn't very forgiving at the time. At 33, I was struggling to make a living and fuming over yet another breakup. I was bitter and angry, and I didn't want to live that way. So I set out on an international adventure that lasted almost two years and turned into a book. I talked to scientists, therapists, and trauma survivors. I interviewed people about forgiving parents and violent offenders. And I traveled to Rwanda to explore the question of forgiveness after genocide. I asked people how they forgave and how it changed them. And I studied the role of seeking forgiveness, too, and programs that facilitate it in schools and communities. So what is forgiveness, anyway? Put it into Google, and you get images like this. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but that is not appealing to me. <laughs> Luckily, Merriam-Webster's defines forgiveness as giving up resentment. Giving up resentment doesn't mean excusing. It doesn't rule out justice. It doesn't require reconciliation. I interviewed people with abusive parents, and some forgave and reconciled, and others forgave and never spoke to that parent again. But either way, they gave up resentment. Now, I'm not saying we can't be angry. Anger is a natural response to pain and injustice. Anger motivates action. It's when anger hardens into bitterness and resentment that it becomes dangerous. Nelson Mandela said, resentment is like swallowing poison and waiting for your enemy to die. It turns out that's true. Research shows that exploding in angry outbursts and repressing anger. Both increase your risk of heart attack over time. Did you know resentment can damage your brain? Every time you think bitterly 
about that person who cut you off in traffic or denied your raise request, your brain is flooded with stress chemicals that limit your ability to problem solve and make you more depressed. On the other hand, studies show forgiveness can lower blood pressure, depression, and anxiety. Now, blame doesn't only hurt us, though. It hurts other people, too. The psychological description of blame is to discharge pain and discomfort. To discharge pain and discomfort. Blame creates bullying, self-loathing, and war. Blame is violent, and forgiveness can stop the violence. You don't have to look far to see what happens when there is no forgiveness. There's estranged relatives who can barely remember why they stopped speaking. There's the war in Israel and Palestine. Now, I'm not suggesting that forgiveness can bring peace to the Middle East, but I am suggesting that the recent war in Gaza is an example of what happens when two groups are unwilling to seek and grant forgiveness. So when I started this exploration, I didn't think I was violent. But I was blaming myself for not accomplishing certain things. And that was violent. I was blaming the world for not giving me what I wanted. And that was violent. When I started being compassionate with myself, and I stopped blaming the world for my disappointments, it changed my life. So, you may have noticed that we're expecting a baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, and I've been, I've been thinking a lot about what I want for my son. I hope he gives people the benefit of the doubt when they make mistakes, especially me. <laughs> I hope people forgive him when he screws up and that he apologizes when he hurts people's feelings. I hope his classmates look to him for leadership and love, and that when he strikes out in the last inning, his teammates forgive him and encourage him to see failure, not as a reason to hate himself, but as a tool to get better. I hope he can go to school without fearing getting shot by someone who's resentful over something that happened in the past. Forgiveness isn't about the past. It's about the future. And that future starts now, with small choices. Like realizing that your spouse yelled because she was tired and not yelling back. Listening more and judging less. Not beating yourself up for that, mis that mistake you made a year ago, a month ago, a week ago, or this morning. So remember Azim, the international investment banker who lost his son Tariq to a shooting while he was delivering a pizza? Azim decided to forgive his, the killer of his son, Tony. He learned that Tony was a troubled 14-year-old kid who was trying to impress a group of older gang members when he shot at Tariq. Azim went to visit Tony in prison and forgave him and Tony wept and apologized. Azim reached out to Tony's grandfather, too. And today, they speak together to students in packed auditoriums like this one. They take the stage, and Azim says, his only grandson shot and killed my only son. But we're best friends. And we're here today because we know that each and every one of you is special. And we don't want any of you to end up dead or in prison. So I want to leave you with one question tonight. What's possible on the other side of seeking and granting forgiveness? Getting a good night's sleep for once? Having a happy marriage? Ending a war? 
What do you think is possible for you and for the world?